Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Pigment Show with the professionals. And today I welcome Ms. Harshiga into the show. Hello everyone, hello sir. And here I'm giving opportunity to the guest to introduce self. So hello everyone, my name is Harshika. Um, I am born and brought up uh, here in Patna itself. Um, I'm from Bihar, natively from Bihar. I've done my schooling from here. Post, uh, post that, I went on to do my graduation in Bachelor's of Science Honours in Nursing from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Patna. And uh, after that, I graduated in the year uh, 2020. And in the very same year, uh, I appeared for the recruitment examination that is conducted at an All India level. And I fortunately qualified. And since then, uh, I've been working. It has been three years since I've been working here. and. Uh, I'm also pursuing post-graduation in humanity subject, um, surely out of interest and uh, yeah, that is about it. Okay, so for the viewers, today is an important episode for Pigment Show just because we are discussing an important aspect for the healthcare professionals. So, kindly of watch the show till the end. Okay, so starting from your experience, so what are your job responsibilities as, you know, the counsellor, as a counsellor, patient counsellor? Uh, so I'll begin with my professional background. Um, okay. um, fortunately, um, we were blessed to be a part of the whole COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, thing okay. as COVID warriors. Mm -hmm. Initially, I worked in the COVID ICU okay. um, and then I got an opportunity to be a part of this uh, initiative uh, by the psychiatry department of our institution uh, which right. was a research counseling initiative in tandem um, with the emerging psychosocial uh, issues during pandemic okay. so As what are the basic psychosocial issues means the issues of the patients at that time during the pandemic yes sir so um, so during the pandemic um, if i can quote a uh, data mm -hmm. according to united nations uh, around 66 percent of females primarily uh, complained of stress okay. and uh, particularly because of they because they were overburdened by work in terms of homeschooling taking care of the elderly and increased so is it because of their uh, family issues or something like that or because of the pandemic especially um, so I think uh, an amalgamation of both uh, okay. because um, pandemic definitely played a significant role mm -hmm. in terms of um, various aspects if I can uh, sectorally put it mm -hmm. in terms of uh, economic aspect primarily okay. there was financial uh, uh, instability that people were dealing with particularly the ones who were in the uh, informal sectors, okay. women who were overburdened by the responsibilities of home mm -hmm. and their own career pro uh, prospects right. and uh, children again, um, they were deprived of schooling and the fear of uh, losses that they might uh, face mm -hmm. ahead uh, because of uh, lost schooling uh, years. So you, you mean to say like the uncertainties, right? That's yes, so the is, precarious, is dubious situation that was present, the right. uncertainties that were present at that point of time, that actually dwindled every one of us in some way or the other during the pandemic, I strongly feel so. Okay, all right. So, and what are the basic problems that, uh, you know, you have faced actually I, as a counsellor, whether the, the job responsibility is that much easier as a counsellor while dealing with, uh, you know, corona patients at that time, just because the patient, uh, attendance most of them will be very anxious to see the patient and uh, the corona pandemic is really unpredictable what will happen with the uh, family members or the, with the patient it is really unpredictable so how you could at that situation so uh, it should be the situation should be a little out of control actually like that okay so how you deal with the counseling part on your experience what are the challenges that you have faced at that end uh, so um Putting it technically, I feel counselling uh, is uh, has a very um, broad perspective to it. Mm -hmm. uh, though it is a subfield of psychology, it okay. has its um, presence in psychiatry. Uh, we studied counselling as a part of uh, one of our subjects in final year, yeah. that was communication and education technology. Okay. And um, I feel it is... Uh, a more elaborate version of guidance 
okay. wherein we are uh, trying to make the person understand um, their own selves and through their own selves they can seek um, they can seek the solutions for themselves so it okay. is not a way um, uh, it is not a way so it of it's basically the guidance okay it's basically the guidance to seek solution by self yes so like so basically it has three forms uh, okay. directive non directive and eclectic okay so in the directive part the counselor plays the uh, primary role okay um, in the non directive part the counselee plays the primary role okay. and the eclectic part Uh, there is a usage of both the approaches okay so um, if it is directive say uh, mm -hmm. uh, for example if i am using a directive part depending on the patient okay. first we have to primarily assess what sort of patient that we are talking to if okay. the patient is um, literate uh, because mm -hmm. um, we uh, we see a lot of um, patients over here particularly mm -hmm. particularly in our setup that uh, we get patients who are not uh, very health literate okay so um if they are health literate they understand what they are going through we uh, we, we choose to go for effort actually to make them understand if they are yes sir literate, yes sir right? they are cooperative um hmm. but i will not say in 100% cases because uh, mental uh, health or any form of uh, instability in terms of our mm -hmm. uh, tranquility mm -hmm. um the first thing that happens is that it affects our decision making okay and our rationality all right so um completely relying on the person to take the uh, decisions uh, also is not a very um practical solution okay um but uh, i think um we first we'll assess the patient and once we have assessed the patient and his ability to make rational judgments okay. um then on that basis we will choose the kind of technique that we want we want to use whether okay. directive so non directive so the first part of this thing is uh, we need to assess the patient yes sir like how rational they could able to take decisions their yes, capacity sir. to take decisions right? yes sir okay and what else so then um then it incorporates various things uh, there are various phases of establishing mm -hmm. a relationship okay. that that is a theoretical aspect of it but uh, uh, so that is the beauty of uh, yeah. counseling i feel mm -hmm. applying theoretical knowledge to solve practical problems so it is it always applicable in practical setting like uh, this theoretical very thing. much so very much it All is right. practical so uh, so the basic approach of the patient like uh, you have told like uh, you need to approach the patient in certain manner so what is the very basic approach of the patient like if somebody is very much anxious about their patient so especially not the patient if uh, the patient that and then is considered so they have so many queries on the especially on the covid time so how will you approach the what is the basic approach yes so so the basic approach uh, would be first step uh, first following that five phases mm -hmm. which is somewhat similar to the one proposed by um, paplow's model of interpersonal relationship also wherein okay. we we'll orient ourselves we will establish the problem statement mm -hmm. then we will move on to other phases uh, wherein we are interacting the patient to find out a pos possible solution then resolution and then terminate the mm -hmm. uh, the entire session mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, for, for covid patients i think um, we, we we also used a tool uh, mm -hmm. that is that was the das assessment tool okay. i already have mentioned on your channel only about it uh, okay. which, which was a uh, depressed depression anxiety and stress assessment tool okay. so it had various uh, uh, parameters okay. and we used we used to ask also to the patient mm -hmm. and we also used to observe also yes sir all right so what simply it is could you mention that simply the type of assessment that you have mentioned now so it was um the scale was very simple um it was based on various signs and symptoms mm -hmm. that a person who is suffering from depression or okay. having any sort of anxiety so issues so with that tool we could assess the level of anxiety yes sir right, of the patient yes sir so the assessment part is done so yes, what sir. is next part so after assessment we will establish a relationship with the patient in second phase we will establish the problem statement 
Okay. We will identify the problem and we will discuss. So, in the relationship, I think it's uh, called the therapeutic relationship. Uh, right? We will establish the therapeutic, therapeutic rela relationship. Uh, relationship. Right. And in assessing, I think there are so many tools uh, mm -hmm. that we can use. One of them being the Johari uh, window model okay. that has four parameters, uh, mm -hmm. four windows, okay. and each of the window, each of the quadrant represents an aspect of one's personality, okay. and that is. Um, if I am recalling correctly, it mm -hmm. is uh, known to self, not known to self, uh, known to others, not known to others. And the windows will be uh, open, uh, closed, uh, blind and unknown. So okay. uh, based on that, um, there are certain things that the patient will very verbally give uh, idea about and verbally mm -hmm. address to it also. And there are certain things the patient will be reluctant to talk about. Talk about so we okay. have to identify because... Uh, so. Uh, so, according to the facts that the patient will tell about, like uh, there should be various things that the patient is will will be readily telling about, yes, and there sir. would be something that the patient wanted. Yes. So, sir. with this type of assessment that you told, we could assess this thing, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So basically, um, the most the trickiest phase I think is assessing and establishing the problem okay. and then we can use various uh, methods the most effective one mm -hmm. i think is listening okay and um, uh, using um, therapeutic communication techniques um, mm -hmm. such as uh, focusing restating paraphrasing active listening mm -hmm. Uh, providing solutions, listening to the problem, giving feedback, getting feedback. So, focusing means whatever the specific things the patient is telling about, we need to focus on that thing. Uh, yes, sir. Basically, okay. this is a phase of building trust. Building trust, okay. Yes, so, focusing sir. is done, then paraphrasing. Paraphrasing means the patient will tell something and on our understanding what we have understood on that statement, we need to paraphrase it to the patient. Is it like that? Uh, no, sir, not exactly. No, not exactly. Paraphrasing uh, refers to restating. Restating. Uh, okay. We as healthcare professionals, which is also a barrier okay. um, in communication, All right. and the most significant one, um, according to me, is semantic barrier, which okay. includes um, language barriers where healthcare professional tends to use not. It does not happen, mm -hmm. but um, out of flow, sometimes it might happen that he healthcare professionals use uh, medical jargons. Okay, and so medical uh, terminologies. Yes, that you uh, mean. and right. sometimes uh, we feel uh, the person might have understood because we have said a particular thing once, mm -hmm. but that is okay. not the case. Um, right. Especially in case uh, in case of women, children, elderly, um, and women, uh, especially the ones uh, who are not working, who are. Mm -hmm. um, um, Homemakers mostly. Okay. Yeah. So especially for them actually. Yes. Sir. Okay. Like we have to. It is just like clarifying. Uh, so uh, so comparably to uh, males and females, uh, who is the more easy to deal with? So who will tell the problems? You know, as such like that. So among the patients, mm -hmm. on your experience. So. Um, um, I have very limited experience, I feel, and uh, I'm still gaining experience. But um, I will um, try to explain this with an example. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so um, recently I was studying this, that uh, when we uh, talk about mental uh, health issues mm -hmm. in terms of gender, okay. so uh, there is um, some conditions which is seen uh, more significantly in females and some condi uh, conditions which is seen more significantly in uh, males. Okay. For example, uh, depressive disorders and eating disorders are more common in females and um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and uh, uh, autism, mm -hmm. it is more common in males. Okay. So we cannot um, compartmentalize into uh, the gender. Yes, sir. Uh, we, uh, no, no. My question is like, you know, there is a common myth like uh, if we ask some about the problems, okay, so on mental health counseling or if we are asking the patients about the problems, so as you have told, like some patient will tell something, okay, the other patient will hide the problems actually. So the tendency to hide the problems are more seen in the female cat. It's a myth like I have heard. 
it is That's, a myth so. it's a myth <laughs> because this is a personality trait okay uh, it cannot be subjected to one particular gender, gender. yeah so. it's according to the personality yes, right sir. it could be common to both all right okay and what else on that counseling part so so i got this opportunity to work uh, as a psychosocial care provider mm -hmm. during covid times i've also got the opportunity to counsel the hiv aids uh, patients okay. i've also got the icit centers right yes okay. sir. yeah uh, and i also have got the opportunity to counsel uh, antenatal postnatal mothers in the maternal and child health area okay as uh, uh, specifically on lactation breastfeeding and complementary feeding uh, weaning on mm -hmm. uh, the child on nutritional aspect okay coming back to the covid time okay so when you are going to counsel the patients where they will be easy to listen or how it would be your experience like whether the patient is that much co patients are that much cooperative or how you feel like on that end especially there is a you know the stress and anxiety level is that much high because even the patient don't know like uh, whether they would survive or not and they would always in unnecessary anxiety and stress even i have seen like um, you know the stable patients who don't have any uh, vital parameters getting affected or something like that but they still they are very worried actually mm -hmm. because they they are suspecting like they could be on on the negative side like they would, their health would deteriorate by being hospitalized like that because of the reason of covid infection yes sir certainly i feel um, this pandemic um, was not just the pandemic for patients mm -hmm. was but also pandemic for the healthcare providers so all whether of you us have were, a thought like you know the healthcare providers also need a counseling like that we all need uh, someone to talk to definitely uh, not very not very uh, technical conversation some conditions of course uh, okay. need technical and professional intervention mm -hmm. but um, to relieve the anxiety actually we need to you know health professionals at that time at least need to talk with the friends and all this yes to, like for to relieve the anxiety and stress like yeah. that that you felt right and primarily because we had so many contributing factors mm -hmm. uh, one of them was quarantine and isolation um, okay. for healthcare professionals wearing that pp was mm -hmm. a very tedious thing okay. to do But it's a protective thing anyway. Yeah, it's, of it course. Is, they must to wear anyway to prevent infection anyway. But it is still yeah, it is a difficult thing, right? To be a uh, with the PPA and working for hours. So all of us were anxious. All of us were stressed. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, anxiousness, uh, to a level where it affects your activities of daily living. Mm -hmm. It is affecting your uh, productivity. Mm -hmm. It is affecting your mood, mm -hmm. and it is also. Uh, posing a threat or uh, disrupting someone else's um, uh, mental health status mm -hmm. then i think um, intervention is required okay. but uh, we all have our own coping mechanism mm -hmm. and stress is an stress is part and parcel of everyone's life so mm -hmm. all right so no i am uh, talking about the you know that covid time actually yes sir that time the stress and anxiety level is you know because of because if we know the exact reason of stress or anxiety then we have a coping me mechanism mm. but on the covid time there is no reason actually right except the covid there is no reason why we are this much stress no sir there i beg to disagree mm -hmm. but i think we had a sufficient reasons mm -hmm. one of them being a uh, fear of death oh. though um, fear of getting infection and subsequently leads to death fear yes. of death as a consequence of the plethora of negative information that was flourishing negative information yes sir right. definitely negative. that affected the mental health of people we used to hear about so many things uh, mm -hmm. during covid times um uh, for women for children for elderly the situation was uh, a little more difficult mm -hmm. and um, isolation quarantine uh, uh, accessibility to health care mm -hmm. um was also some of the contributing factors that um, aided in mental health disruptions mm -hmm. and most of the people uh, they will be reluctant also to go to hospital at that time just because of the fear like if you go to the hospital i have heard like that if you go to the hospital they will put you in ventilator mm -hmm. like that so some of the people have a, they are reluctant even to go to hospital and get treatment at covid times as well yes yes yeah all right 
So that's a COVID um, counseling story. So coming uh, to the ICTC center, like uh, you know, you were dealing with uh, HIV infected patients and all. So, uh, what is your experience on that actually? Um, so, since HIV uh, uh, patients uh, over here, I was working in the integrated counseling and testing center, mm -hmm. and um, though. Um, I have interacted not with much uh, patients, but I did get opportunity to inter interact with a couple uh, of patients. And uh, we are um, seeing a sense of uh, ostracization that they are facing. Okay. And uh, also um, telling From them the family about as well. the family and also yes, society. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And telling them about uh, the disease condition was not the goal. Uh, telling them about adherence to the drug, drug regime, mm -hmm. referring them to the ART centers, and uh, ensuring that uh, they, are, they have received their medications mm -hmm. and they are uh, in compliance with the medication that was the primary role. And apart from that, um, fostering positive uh, health behaviors mm -hmm. and uh, sensitizing them to um, uh, staying away from behaviors that might deteriorate their conditions. Okay. Yes. So, so simply that uh, they have an opportunity to lead a productive life even after getting infection, but the patient will be reluctant to listen to all these things like about the treatment options and yes, uh, sir. yeah and also the family members will uh, make them uh, you know keep away and they will be on you know under the family they will get uh, you know ostracized and like that okay so we have this preconceived notion for example i will uh, share one experience mm -hmm. uh, one person from the lgbtqi community mm -hmm. uh, she had contracted the infection and uh, she was uh, confused and she might have faced something um, that she was having a lot of dist uh, distrust towards mm -hmm. healthcare professionals mm -hmm. but um, and uh, through uh, your channel i will like to uh, i would want to spread this message that we should they are very much a part of our society mm -hmm. uh, they are very much uh, normal and um, we should not have a sense of um, treating them differently um, is a wrong attitude towards them mm -hmm. and um, Yes, sir. so basically she was uh, she was positive. She might have contracted the infection by any means, non having a non judgmental attitude towards uh, the patient and the patient belonging to any strata, mm -hmm. any culture, any tradition, any religion, mm -hmm. uh, anything. We have to be non judgmental. And so when so I actually it exists like whenever somebody is become positive on HIV, especially. So there are so many causes. It could be on so many causes like. Uh, sharing the needles or even blood transfusion all right so sometimes could be if we are helping some accident patient or something like that so, so there are so many conditions that it could be transferred and but still in the society there is only one reason mm -hmm. like it would be only on sexual conduct it could be transferred like that so they will uh, they will see the patient like that actually i think that yes, is sir. very common actually, there is a stigma existing on that. Right? So we did record uh, the mode of transmission mm -hmm. for a survey purpose uh, because all the data had to go to uh, NACO. NACO so yeah. um, uh, majority of the cases that were positive um, belongs to the migrant laborers and migrant workers. Okay. So we saw and one psychological aspect to it is that they are staying away from their family they are staying away mm -hmm. from their spouses mm -hmm. and uh, because and coupled with lack of information and the unfathomable uh, lack of information okay. that is there among the uh, those people so when we will identify that uh, this is the group that is contracting most infection mm -hmm. uh, that will become the target population okay so that is how uh, later uh, so there, there are so many interventions that will come into account like sensitizing them, ensuring that they are getting their medications and also educating them mm -hmm. and uh, encouraging positive health behaviors. Mm -hmm. All right. So it was not that much easy to, you know, counsel such type of patients. Yes, like so maintaining this. confidentiality, building trust, mm -hmm. uh, 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 I think is challenging. 
and for them to share uh, their personal details with us personal details as well right anyway it should be completely confidential right yes, sir. okay so uh, we will be sharing the details and all these things to nac only right mm, yes so the data goes to nac data goes to nac all right and what else on the counseling part on other specialization like you have a wide variety of specialization on counseling yes so right? then i have got the opportunity to uh, work in the maternal and child health area mm -hmm. and uh, as lactation counselor mm -hmm. and uh, i have been talking to antenatal postnatal mothers and mm -hmm. also in the pediatric department uh, to the mothers uh, either breastfeeding uh, their child or weaning off uh, mm -hmm. mothers with children of say suppose 6 months or more than 6 months okay on on uh, diet and nutrition uh, mainly um, in terms of complementary feeding mm -hmm. weaning foods and how did, that can be prepared and what all foods that can be incorporated what are the uh, parameters that has to be kept But the main thing of focus is i think exclusive breastfeeding for 6 months right yes, that sir. time period, yes. right and then we need to start with the supplementary feeding and all but i think most of the mothers they don't know like exclusive breastfeeding is that have that much importance on this uh this six months like that so that's a challenging thing on that counseling i think isn't so, it so um since uh, the health uh, parameters have uh, improved mm -hmm. and it is progressively in, uh, improving in our country mm -hmm. one of them being institutional deliveries Okay. So we are having around ninety to ninety-five percent of institutional deliveries. Okay. And um, so that is a good parameter. Of good health, parameter. Right? But contrary to that, obviously, mm -hmm. if a woman is undergoing institutional delivery, mm -hmm. anybody, uh, a healthcare professional who is conducting the delivery, or uh, the nursing officers who are there, uh, they will sensitize the mother about the importance and the uh, of breastfeeding, exclusive mm -hmm. breastfeeding, and the importance of the benefits it imparts to both mother and the child. But uh, even after that, um, uh, we have seen that uh, mothers are quite reluctant um, okay. towards breastfeeding, and there are several associated factors. But um, uh, regular reminder and uh, positive uh, associate uh, along with positive reinforcement, I think. it aids um, in promoting breastfeeding okay so sometimes uh, you know there is a tendency like if the mother is not in good terms with uh, the spouse or family members like that it could affect the child as well right yes sir so i have been talking to uh, mothers on a regular basis mm -hmm. and uh, say suppose if i am talking to 10 mothers um, in a day mm -hmm. so out of those 10 mothers i think 4 5 or 6 maybe uh they will be uh, complaining of some sort of pain mm -hmm. and uh, after post assessment um, if it is a post operative case say for example if it is a case of lscs mm -hmm. uh, the pain is inevitable it is bound to happen for some time okay. and uh, so we do acknowledge that and we will say and we will console the mother that uh, this will be there and if it is unbearable of course other medical interventions are uh, done Mm -hmm. but uh, we will explain to her the reason for pain but if it is uh, not operative oper uh, like surgery related mm -hmm. then i think uh, it is mostly psychosomatic so the that you said that because if they will have any sort of problem with their spouses or family members mm -hmm. they will be they will tend to re uh, displace the uh, they will use displacement yes sir yeah. So, so yes so so they will be reluctant to feed the baby and taking care of the baby like that yes sir yes. so, so and how counseling helps on that actually right. it helps a lot mm -hmm. so uh, i what i do is that i will not tell the mother to breastfeed in first place i mm -hmm. will not tell i will not talk about the issue only okay. i start by talking about what she likes i start by talking about um, what she does in her free time mm -hmm. uh, who all are there in her family a friendly talk yes like so yes so because when we are focusing on the problem um, i Darkly. think yes so yes so i think uh, um, they will be more reluctant mm -hmm. when we are nagged That's upon normal human tendency i think yes so right? yes so if we are said to do something as children also if we are said yeah. to do something we will tend to not do it not so that is the case uh, so i will like talk about 
10 other things mm -hmm. apart from the actual topic mm -hmm. and then gradually i will come up to this actual topic i will not just say that you have to do it mm -hmm. i will say that uh, you know why it is important okay. uh, you know why it should be done mm -hmm. and not just important for you for your child also okay. then i will try to um, help her establish relationship with the child mm -hmm. because if she is having any sort of uh, problem uh, with the uh, with spouse or with family members she will not even like the child mm. so what will happen she will not carry the child and um, she will be um, she will say that she is feeling sick uh, she wants to sleep and all of those things okay. but uh, that's why you have termed it as psychosomatic right yes then, sir yes yeah. sir one uh, pain that is radiating um, from uh, a pain that is psychological that radiates on to the child and migraine pain yes sir yeah okay so that's the thing right okay so there are so many things to you know think about while giving the counseling yes, so sir. not directly focus on the problem actually yes, then sir. there would be more relaxed tense yes right? sir okay and uh, on like tension counseling and uh, what else on i think you have a uh, um, worked on intensive care unit yes sir i have worked well. in a trauma yeah. intensive care unit for about 8 9 months okay so the trauma area is that much sensitive actually in the sense like the patient will be coming with a sudden accident or something like that so the stress level and all the things would be very high so especially to deal with the patient attendant and on that situation would be very difficult and yes, what sir. is your as you have told like your approach on this uh, lactation counseling so how is your approach on that part like so so uh, this question i will begin uh, by giving one information mm -hmm. and that is um, so uh, this indian medical association um, uh, according to indian medical association mm -hmm. around uh, 70% uh, of healthcare professionals face uh, and this is particularly for healthcare professionals face uh, face some or the other sort of violence at workplace okay so uh, uh, maybe in trauma department trauma and emergency department and out of maybe. that uh, out of that um, 70 or say 75% percent, 50 to 60% percent is in icu and emergency setup okay yes sir so um, yes it is stressful and that is why this is happening mm -hmm. but uh, a very good uh, initiative that has uh, that our government has come up uh, with uh, especially for the epidemic times because at that time uh, precariousness is uh, at peak okay. everybody is so uncertain about things mm -hmm. so protecting the healthcare professionals is vital mm -hmm. so the government came up with the epidemic disease amendment bill 2020 mm -hmm. that protects the healthcare professionals and um, it also has a provision of uh, um, providing punishment to the one uh, yeah on that cases like yes sir, the uh, one who is uh, doing any sort of violent behavior, behavior, behavior yes sir. so it is really needed so there are so many incidents yes sir, it is and it is stressful uh, mm -hmm. in terms that uh, they are not normal patients they are somewhat i was there in neurotrauma as well but whatever trauma patients are there first they are uh, they go to the triage area mm -hmm. depending so on once the patient is received i think <coughs> we need to first and foremost we need to restrict the patient attendance actually once you receive the patient going to all the formalities through the process mm -hmm. like need to restrict the patient attendant to the maximum that would help i think yes so or and also in terms that uh, trauma patients mostly have open wounds mm -hmm. which uh, exposes them to um, developing infections mm -hmm. so restricting visitors and res uh, restricting uh, attendants uh, yeah, is the first that is a good that reason for restricting as well yes, sir, just because of the infection factors yes sir. right okay so that all over your experience on this patient counseling actually and patient counseling is that much uh, given at most importance actually nowadays uh, in our country as well but previously it was not like that just because i think there are some strategies that you need to tell on so that, there right? is actually stark disparity when yeah. we talk of health and uh, mental health mm -hmm. um, when we talk of health so actually the health will cover needs to cover the mental health as well right it because should healthy health is by definition it is mental well being also it is health and, right? yes sir of course and that is really a good point why mm -hmm. i am segregating it on uh, why i am saying that uh, it is so by merely health it means physical health right 
No, so the so or absence is, absence of disease. It is not merely absence of disease. So well being means it should be mental well being as well, right? It should be holistic well being. Holistic well being, yes, right? Okay. So, uh, like when you told that I should mention, like I'm, I have uh, 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 some data. Okay. So, um, why I'm saying that uh, it is not an analogy, uh, but rather a paradox. Mm -hmm. So, and why I'm differentiating health and mental health, mm -hmm. because that is how it is looked uh, at, mm -hmm. and not just in our country, but also globally. Okay. So um, when we say our, our nation, we are progressing, uh, we, ha we are a progressing nation definitely. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have improved in terms of uh, health expenditure, mm -hmm. from government expenditure to uh, out of pocket expenditure or insurance coverage and all of those things. These parameters have improved. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, in maternal and child health, uh, if we say, the maternal mortality rate, the neonatal mortality rate, infant mortality rate, under five mortality rate, all of them has decreased. Mm -hmm. The inst the percentage of institutional deliveries have increased. Um, yes. Immunization. So state I think you have mentioned like ninety five percent of yes, uh, institutional deliveries. Yes, uh, right? yes, sir. And it is different for rural and urban era, but yeah. uh, the average is this one. Ninety five percent. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the immunization status has improved. Mm -hmm. uh, it is somewhere around eighty four percent. And also uh, recently uh, WHO. Uh, came up uh, with a list of countries mm -hmm. and India ranked one first topmost country uh, in terms of believing in uh, vaccination, vaccination in terms of lowest vaccination hesitancy, hesitancy which okay. is a really good thing so right. we have this one very good picture of the health status of the country mm -hmm. but on contrary to that when we talk of mental health so um, I was just reading um, uh, a document of Lancet Psychiatry which says mm -hmm. that around uh, 14 point uh, and this is specific to India mm -hmm. so around 14.3% uh, of our population suffers from some or the other form of mental health conditions mm -hmm. uh, which which constitutes around 197 million people so means 14.3 percentage in the whole world population it covers India actually 14.3 percentage it's from India uh, yes, sir. out of the total population, uh -huh. like suppose if the Indian population is 100, so out of that 100, 14.3% people suffers from mental health conditions. Okay. And which amounts to around uh, 197 uh, if million. A million people. I don't remember the exact figure, but it is approximately 197 million people. Okay. And uh, when we talk of globally, so we have the report by WHO, which says that uh, globally around one approximately 1 billion people suffers from mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. And recently, um, um, in the year 2020, uh, 2023 itself, um, uh, w, uh, this thing, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development, uh, I think, uh, uh, working group, I think they have released uh, this World Happiness Report 2023 uh -huh. and India has ranked 126th out of 136 nations. Oh, in the uh, World Happiness Index. Yes, sir. Um, oh. And this is a grim status considering we yeah. are improving in health parameters and the mental health. St uh, so basically, uh, we can say that we are a healthy population living long but living unhappy somewhere okay so that's the thing living unhappy that means uh, so many of the people are with uh, mental health disorder or disease like that one so, out of every seven person that we encounter on mm -hmm. a daily basis suffers from some or the other form of mental health condition mental health conditions yes. okay so what about the availability of mental health centers in india like that on your opinion so it is very few, very few, right? And also we have a shortage of a specialist in terms of psychiatrist or um, psychologist or uh, social workers mm -hmm. working particularly in this area. Okay. And also nurse. So I'll just quote one thing. Mm -hmm. In terms of doctor-patient ratio, I think I think it is uh, one is to fourteen fifty-six uh, population. Uh, okay. Uh, doctor patient ratio and the nurse patient ratio is uh, 1.7 is 2000 and the proposed WHO norm in terms of doctor patient ratio is 1 is to 1000 and in terms of nurse patient ratio it is 3 is to 1000 so clearly we have uh, a shortage, shortage of, of healthcare professionals well, healthcare yes, sir. Yes, sir. and also the centers mental health centers and yes, sir. Okay. but uh, still um, we have uh, various governments that are coming up um, and various institutions that are coming up with very good initiatives addressing mm -hmm. to the essentiality of the condition. For example, NIMHANS has come up uh, with the telepsychiatry uh, consultation, consultation service. As well. Yes. Yeah. Sir. Mm -hmm. 
and I think it is uh, coming up on all the mental health centers reputed all the centers it is having an, that initiative okay daily consultation yes that is a problem as a psychological counselor okay to the patient uh, so what are the stigmas and struggles on your journey as a counselor so so there are three aspects to your question uh, the mm -hmm. first one is uh, stigma mm -hmm. the second one is struggle mm -hmm. and the third one is profession so i'll begin with the uh, f uh, third one profession okay. mm -hmm. so prima facie i believe um, we are not into a profession but mm -hmm. rather service mm -hmm. and when we put uh, something in the ambit of profession i think we limit the scope okay. we have the um, ability of being a, an economist a psychologist an advocate, mm -hmm. a social worker, and so many, so on, so on, and so forth. So that's a wide scope, actually. Yes, so and mm -hmm. also, I strongly um, disagree with this popular notion of um, nursing professionals, particularly being underrated. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a dogma, and uh, uh, we are not in a competition, and mm -hmm. um, but we are in a service. So. Um, I yeah, think we are in this research. Yes, sir. This was the yeah. professional aspect. Mm -hmm. Coming on to the stigma, um, uh, I think going by the dictionary meaning, it mm -hmm. means any unfair uh, disbelief or any unfair belief. Okay. That is the dictionary meaning. That uh, uh, if uh, if as far as I understand, I think anything that is present without any empirical back backing, mm -hmm. and that is what we have studied in psychology. If technically speaking, any fixed false belief is called delusion. Mm -hmm. So I think. Um, you know, giving importance to um, stigma is actually strengthening the stigma. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we should not. But if I have to mention, I think uh, the first one is a, is a, a critical and a funny one also that mm -hmm. uh, uh, people have this notion that uh, nursing officers are mostly uh, females. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is not the case and uh, we should not take but away. Still it is, so I don't think so because still there are so many nursing officers as male and there is 80 20 ratio they have implemented just because yes. of that reason yes, sir. because the male population is increasing in the profession right still yes, sir. but still, <laughs> still people, I don't think so. people feel that way uh, that uh -huh. only uh, males are there in the profession but that is not females. the case you mean females sorry, eh, sorry yes females are there in the profession and uh, i think but we the should not see males also in the profession actually when they come to the hospital right mm. yeah. but i think we should whoever not have, whoever have visited the hospital they may know Yes, right. sir. And we should not especially take away the credit from uh, seniors like you and all the male that is there uh, who are there in the profession doing mm -hmm. so good work. And mm -hmm. uh, the second stigma that I feel is there is um, stereo uh, that stereotype, ideological stereotype that is present. Um, okay, so what do you mean by that? Ideological uh, so, ideological stereotype is the uh, like putting um, the mis perception uh -huh. regarding the roles and responsibility and okay roles and responsibility of a particular profession yes so, sir. Your, yeah so there are various contributing factors i feel um, such as um, there are various contribu uh, contributing factors such as history also plays mm -hmm. a significant role mm -hmm. um, lack of autonomy lack of professional advancement all of these plays a significant role but solution i think we can divide it into two parts D uh, that depends on the source mm -hmm. if the source is from the fraternity i think we should just have a let it go attitude mm -hmm. because um, anybody who understands the nuances and still carries a stigma i think uh, clarifying is not worth mm -hmm. and um, if it is from somebody who do not understand the nuances and the nitty gritties of the profession, I think we should assert it vocally and politely. We should tell them mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong about it. Mm -hmm. And coming to the third aspect of it is struggle. Mm -hmm. So um, struggle again, I have already mentioned about the shortage of healthcare professionals um, and uh, the problem becomes even more staggering in terms of uh, people who are working in the informal sectors or the people who are working as ad hoc professionals mm -hmm. because their uncertainties are more mm -hmm. so it, the struggles become even more and at uh, societal levels i think uh, there is um, lack of health literacy mm -hmm. and there is also um, unreal expectations out of healthcare professionals mm -hmm. so this i feel um, are the struggles and also at um, individual levels uh, since i am a girl i think i should talk about girls mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Though a uh, female contributes around um, $3 trillion of global GDP mm -hmm. in healthcare, mm -hmm. 
but if given more opportunities and conducive environment um, and better working conditions um, i am not being um, specific about one particular place but everywhere around mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they will be contributing uh, around dollar uh, 126 trillion to the economy mm -hmm. uh, as as far as i remember that i read okay. it somewhere right. and uh, so that is uh, the role of women uh, in healthcare mm -hmm. so we should be promoting it and that is at individual level and at personal level sir i feel um, i am a bit introverted mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless i'm working on it I'm trying mm -hmm. to talk more <laughs> right, you have already talked more in the <laughs> show actually. So, I don't think so that you are an introvert. So, introvert don't have that much confidence to appear in show Thank or something you, like that. Alright, okay. So, there is a lot of hidden anxiety. So, other, other than your profession, what are the leisure time activities that you will do? So, um, I like reading, right. uh, I like creative writing, mm -hmm. I like uh, listening to good So, what is creative writing means? So creative writing as in, I like writing about... Uh, is it in the blogs or...? Uh, I haven't yet uh, written for any blog, uh, vlog, okay. mm -hmm. but um, I ha everyone has a little black, black dress, but mm -hmm. I have a little black diary. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, I tend to write uh, on various... So any plan that, uh, that uh, whatever you are writing creatively should be placed on the blog, it would be much better, right? Okay, any plans like that, future plans? Mm, I haven't yet thought about thought it. Thought about so. it, all right. And so also, like I like watching good web series, listening to good podcasts. So what are the usual web series that you watch? Normally? The recent one that I have watched is, uh, um, um, it is a Netflix docu-series actually. Okay. So the title is Live to 100, The Secrets mm -hmm. of Blue Zone. Mm -hmm. And I would highly recommend everyone to watch the show. So what is it all about actually? That one. Yes, so, so basically, um, the host of the show is uh, traveling to various places, the mm -hmm. places where there are maximum uh, centenarians, mm -hmm. centenarians as in people who are living beyond 100 years mm -hmm. to recognize uh, and identify their uh, reason and life. the secrets for uh, their long life. Long life, yes, all right. Sir. So that's, uh, uh, it should be diet, exercise and all these things like that. You are no, sir, to the patient no. like, you know, it should be diet, a good exercise and all these mm. things. Usually the counsellors will counsel to the patient like that for Di healthy living and for a mental health, good mental health and all these things, right? Okay. Diet, exercise definitely is a part of it. Um, but apart from diet and exercise, um, he like I have watched the docu series. Mm -hmm. He also talked about um, having good social relationships, mm -hmm. um, interacting, talking to people. So it's as a, something like a science fiction, right? Series mm -hmm. like a science. It isn't fiction. It is based on facts and. Um, so only facts, no fiction. Uh, he is actually basically interacting with the various centenarians, and he's trying to know about their. Um, Way, way of living and uh, what uh, because of what uh, that they are surviving so long. Uh, they're basically, their secrets to launch. So I have read somewhere like you know if uh, the secret of centenarian is green tea actually the main ingredient of the centenarians. So I think we should all start with drinking green tea. <laughs> no, no, I have already started with the green tea. <laughs> oh, that's great. Mm. So I have read somewhere like uh, in. Yokinawa, there is a place in Japan like Yokinawa. Yes, sir, yes. Yeah, sir. Yokinawa, and there are so many centenarians are living on that. And uh, it is written in the book like Ikigai. Mm -hmm. So when they have talked about the uh, when they have got a conversation with the centenarians to ask about their secret, so the main ingredient common with all of them is green tea. Actually, I have read in the okay, okay. Ikigai book. Okay. And that's why I am asking. Yes, yeah, so Ikigai is a uh, is a a book of course but it is basically a concept mm -hmm. that is there uh, in Okinawa Japan mm -hmm. and um, it basically means purpose of life having purpose in life mm -hmm. so that is also important yeah. uh, according to so the what host. is your purpose of life so my purpose of life is to be happy <laughs> okay <laughs> that is, everybody's purpose of life may be happiness right yes so <laughs> all right so there are too much information uh, in this video that is shared by uh, Ms. Harshiga and we are very thankful to have uh, Harshiga on the show. Thank actually, you. every professional in the show is actually a gem. Uh, we consider like that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.